Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of festival co-directors Namita Gokhale and William Thalrimple, producer Sanjay K. Roy, and all our colleagues from Teamwork Arts, we are pleased to welcome you to the virtual edition of JLF Toronto 2022. Jail Richardson's debut novel, Gutter Child, is a fictional, heart-wrenching account of a dystopian realm drawing from the brutal realities of colonial history. A nation divided between the privileged mainstream and the police gutter, the novel follows a girl's journey through this stratified society and her attempts to shape her own destiny and defy the system. In conversation with the Panjana Pal, Richardson explores the nuances of injustice, power, and the essence of belonging. Jail Richardson is the best-selling author of Gutter Child, which was a finalist for the Amazon First Novel Award and received a Word Award in 2022. Richardson lives in Brampton, Ontario, where she serves as the executive director for the Festival of Literary Diversity. Dipanjana Pal is the author of the novel Harsha Bai Baby and the Puchku series of children's books, and The Painter, a biography of the artist Raja Ravi Verma. She is the managing editor of the website Film Companion. All our sessions can be viewed on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Please follow us on JLF Lit Fest across Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook to be notified of the upcoming sessions. And stay tuned to jlflitfest.org/toronto for the full schedule and information about our speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, Gutter Child, Jail Richardson in conversation with the Panchna Pal. This session is presented by Token Means LLP. The Panchna. over to you thank you jail for uh, making the time for this conversation and congratulations on this uh, heart wrenching novel uh, mm. which is uh, if you were thinking young adult is like a light and breezy read got a child ain't it I'm just <laughs> saying <laughs> i don't um, know how to do light and breezy i realize it's just not in my <laughs> wheel I mean given the world that we're in light and breezy I think is quite hard to come by uh but it and all the more precious for it no doubt uh I'm very grateful for light and breezy reads but um the darkness also needs to find its place and I think yeah. it very much finds a place um in Gutter Child which for those of you who may not have read it it's about the story of Elamina who we meet uh, who when we meet her is 15 years old she's recently lost her mother and um she finds herself in an institution called the Livingston Academy and very quickly we sort of get introduced to this dystopic world that you've set up uh which has its own geography it has a rather elaborate set of histories and i'm very deliberately using the word histories and we'll talk about that later mm. but um i thought before we sort of get deep into it uh Can you just describe the world of Gutter Child with yeah. you know the mainland the gutter and the hill Yeah Yeah I think for me I was really interested in exploring the different the different ways we uh what it was like for someone to grow up in a world that was designed for their failure that was sort of like the central question what what do you do when you grow up in a world that's designed for your failure when do you know about it and what do you do once you know about it And so I wanted to create a place um where uh the gutter is where folks are born, uh soci people are born and they're assigned a debt at birth and they have to pay it off in order to gain redemption. But there are very limited ways to actually pay off their debt. And so most people remain in the gutter for their entire life and some people get out and get this opportunity to sort of work off their debt on the mainland and then there's also a place called the hill which has sort of a different history and a different journey that um has a different opportunity for soci people um if you're born there so those were sort of the big contrast for me was the mainland and the gutter and then the hill became this other place that i needed to invent or create in order to see different paths different opportunities and the contrast um between a soci person who's born on the hill and a soci person who's born on in the gutter. Yeah, and uh it's it's fascinating how you sort of what the hill starts to come across as to both Elamina and other soci people 
uh, in the course of the story, which I thought was very interesting. And the other thing that struck me immediately when I started reading Gutter Child was that there's so much that you imply, but don't state obviously, not the least of which is the racial factor through all of this. Um, you don't write in as many words what race the mainlanders are and what race the Sosi people are. Um, you also don't give a specific term like apartheid, for example, yeah. to the system of the debt and uh, servitude in, and oppression. Uh, there's also there's also the network, which is reminiscent of the Underground Railroad, you know, things like that. Um, can you talk a little bit about why you chose to keep it both vague and specific at the same time? Because I, I thought it was such a great device to bring in relatability because yeah. you know then it becomes about the idea of inequality and unfairness rather than a very specific manifestation of it yeah yeah and I think for me I was definitely very interested in thinking about the black community and some of the things that um, black folks through history have gone through but I was also aware that what's happened to Black folks have often has also happened to other communities and that colonization is really sort of the consistent factor. And so I was trying to look at ways of representing and addressing colonization that would, you know, I was very much influenced by, influenced by the caste system in India. That was one of the first kind of concepts um, that I was thinking about and exploring, but I was also looking at, um, you know, how, how colonization has impacted a number of countries in Africa, um, apartheid being just uh, one. I was looking at the residential system in Canada. You know, wherever you go, whatever country you go to, there is a system which said, you know, these people are better, are going to be given more, and these people are going to have it harder and worse. And it's going to be like that from the day they come out of the womb and they will spend their entire lives either underneath it or trying to get over top of it. And so um, there was lots of material to work with. And I think giving it different names and being both vague and specific, as you said, helped me to kind of focus in on the things that I most wanted to address. Um, you know, one of the things all the characters who are born in the gutter have a scar on their hand in addition to their debt. And that was because I really wanted something, a physical marker, something that people could see and oppress them based on what they see. And I also wanted the debt because I wanted something that they carry inside of them, something only they would know how much weight, how much debt they're carrying with them, which could affect both them and their children, right? The debt is passed mm -hmm. down and kind of grows generation after generation. So I wanted something that was invisible that you would walk around the world with um, and feel, but that people wouldn't know unless you actually explained it and unpacked it. And so um, doing those things, focusing on what I was most interested in exploring um, allowed me to be specific in that way to say like, these are the things I'm interested in. What happens when people can see that you're different? What happens when people can't see what you're carrying around inside of you? Um, and then without ever mentioning the term black or white or any sort of racialization, I think was something um, I didn't, I mean, I did it intentionally. I definitely made the choice not to, but one of the best, it's one of my best decisions, honestly, in the book, <laughs> because um, I was doing a school visit a while back and um, the students were talking about the Sosi characters and the characters in the gutter and the characters in the hill and the people in the mainland. And I think it was really freeing for them to talk about the difficulties that some of the characters are facing and the choices that some of the characters are facing without having to carry their own race into the situation. You know, the white students could talk about mainlanders and the black students could talk about mainlanders. And they didn't have to feel like they were talking about each other in a way or somehow mm. pulling each other across. Um, and I really loved hearing so many different students from different communities seeing connections in their own family history, seeing the ways in which, you know, there was a student from South America who felt like it was really speaking to sort of shadism and things that had happened in their home country. Um, and it was really um, lovely to see them all talk so openly and freely about the ways it connected to them personally without having to carry or take away from a community that's more familiar to them or that's real. 
Mm-hmm. And it's also uh, like you were just saying, you know, it, it's a good reminder that you know uh, we tend to have in uh, formal discourse it tends to be divided into binaries of black mm-hmm. or white, yeah. and of course the reality is that it's a spectrum, yeah. um, and it's so much more about power than it is really about color or uh, I mean these are signifiers rather than the actual reason, but. Um, should we should we get a little bit from the book? Will you read us sure. a little bit from the book before we go on? So this comes um, from, you know, about 50 pages in. Um, it's a scene where Elamina, as you had mentioned at the beginning, Elamina arrives at Livingstone Academy. She's grown up. She's Sosi, born in the gutter, but has been raised by a mainland woman. And her mother has passed away. And Elamina has been trying to figure out what this academy is and why she's here. And she's sort of learning in bits and pieces what it really means to be a gutter child and what her debt is and how she's going to pay this off. And so this encounter is her first time meeting with one of the instructors at the academy, who also happens to be, you know, the only instructor who's Sosi, who's working off her debt at this school. Um, And so this is a bit of a conversation between the two of them. (laughs) When I was younger, I used to stare at myself for hours. I'd study my face and the strangeness of it in comparison with the faces I saw at the park and on the covers of mother's magazines. I would gaze at every feature and I would ask myself the same questions, tilting my head this way and that to see it at different angles. Am I pretty? Am I kind of pretty or really pretty or almost pretty? How about now? When mother asked what I was doing in the bathroom and why I was taking so long, I would tell her I was studying. And it was true. I was studying how I looked, creating a list of the things I liked, the things that made me happy or proud, like the round of my head and the shape of my eyes. I liked the way I smiled and the way my top lip slipped up over my gum, like it was too big to hold inside. But eventually, I saw uneven teeth, an oversized grin, and a head that was bald like a boy's. I longed for hair like mothers, with skin just as fair and scar-free, and I started to wash my face and brush my teeth with the lights off or with my eyes closed, like my own face was something no one else should have to see, including me. You never had a gutter woman do your hair, Ida says, and I shake my head. Weren't there any gutter women in that town where you were raised? I watch Ida standing behind me, hands on my shoulders, waiting for me to respond. Miss Ida, You're the first gutter woman I've ever met. First one I've ever spoken to as far as I can remember. Ida closes her eyes and shakes her head before clearing her throat. Now then, you're going to have to tell me what it was like being out there with all those mainlanders instead, she says. I shrug. It was different. Well, I figured that much, baby girl, but when you've lived something no one else has, you have to tell folks what it's like, as though they can't see and they're asking you what red looks like. When someone asks you for a picture, you got to spell it out in color for them, she says. I try to think of how to explain Cape Down, but I can't find the words. How long have you been here, I say. Left the gutter when I was five years old for the academy track. Spent ten years at North End Academy, which is a place I don't care to remember, that's for sure. I worked down the way for a bit until Mr. Greggers hired me. Been working for 20 years, maybe, so 30 years on the mainland is my guess though I'm sure my debt manager could count it better. 30 years. Sounds like a whole lot, I know, but the truth is it doesn't feel that long at all. Besides, I got it really good here, she says, with a toothy smile that's full of gaps and one tooth that's mostly brown. How much longer till you're done? Till you get redemption freedom, I say. She takes a comb and pulls it through my hair, and when a piece of the comb breaks off, she grabs another from the pile and tries again. I'll be done in 20 or so, I think. But truth is, I'll probably work as long as I can. Maybe I'll buy a house in the city and come in with the mainland decos, she says. But I got to keep going. Why? I got family who are counting on me. I was the one that got out to make the way. When I get redemption freedom for myself, I get to give it to one other person. I figure I can get one of my grandnieces out, hopefully one with a baby. That way I can get two more generations out at the same time, set our family upright for the future. But there's still others. There's always others. Don't think I could enjoy my own life knowing they're still in the gutter, but I didn't do everything in my power to help, she says. In Cape Town, you aren't allowed to work until you're 18, and even then it's optional, I say. Mainlanders can't start until 18. It's the law. 
It's the law that you can't work, she says. And when I nod, she shakes her head like the unfairness of it is almost too much. I tell her about the kids being kids legislation and the youth enjoyment opportunities, how the mainland kids are encouraged to explore, and how mother used to take me to Cape Town museums during the day when other kids were at school, where they'd let us in at twice the price. Ida shakes her head again, her jaw stiff with anger. I feel a sharp pain in my scalp as she pulls the plastic comb through my hair a little harder. Do you miss your family? I say through gritted teeth and Ida nods. Most days I miss them fine, just in passing, but some days I admit it's hard knowing they're there and I'm here, that the little ones don't know anything about me except what I write down in letters. But I try not to worry because nothing good comes from it. All worrying can do is bring a sickness that starts deep inside. And I got no time to be sick, baby girl. I got to stay well up here most of all, she says, tapping her finger against the side of her head. Besides, besides I'd rather be here making a way than waiting in the gutter. Can't complain about that. But there's a lot she could complain about. And I think about telling her that it's another way the mainland life is different. Mainlanders get up in arms angry when they don't get their way. And when they complain loud enough, the mainland government usually does something about it. I mean, I, I love Ida's character because she's one of the, uh, she's, I mean, she's the, like you've read in this piece, she's the first uh, associate person that uh, Elamina meets, but she's also uh, She's so strong in uh, in exactly, I think, the way that uh, women tend to be. Like, there's yeah. an uh, she's a bearer of histories. She's a carrier of the present. She's she's solid. You know, uh, yeah. she sort of she literally connects Elamina to um, to the past that yeah. Elamina doesn't know about. Uh, with and uh, and there's that chosen family quality yeah. that she. Uh, embodies herself and she tells Elamina about and it becomes so important to her in the life uh, that she ends up leading in Gata Child. Was was there someone that you had in mind or did someone inspire Ida or is she completely a creation of your own? No, I mean, Ida is very, very much based on my grandmother, uh, my dad's um, mother and all those qualities that you described were qualities that she embodied always. And she was a person in my life who, you know, carried history in her body. Um, she was a big woman, tall and big, like strong, but also just big. And so much of that was about um, both the joy of food and family, but also the trauma of Black lives and Black living in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, when she was growing up as a young girl. And she didn't have an education, but she always pushed my dad to kind of move ahead and, and take the family, take his family in a, in a better direction. And she was just like one of those people where um, she passed away when I was about 14. And she still like lives in my heart as like someone who impacted and shaped who I am. And um I think that's kind of what Ida is for Elamina. She's this first, first Sosi woman. She's the first woman to teach uh, Elamina how to do her hair. Um, first Sosi woman to teach her like how to see herself in the mirror and how to understand what she's seeing in the mirror and why she's not liking what she's seeing. And that's so, so important. And it's mm. weird too, because I have a very close relationship with my mom, but my mom is much lighter than me, which, you know, I'm quite light to begin with. Um, but it means like there's a couple references to, you know, Elamina not being able to figure out who she is by by looking at her own mother or her adopted mother. And that's kind of how I felt growing up. Um, you know, mm -hmm. it was difficult to kind of come to terms with things that I was thinking about myself when my mom wasn't going through the same things in the same way. Um, um, so, yeah. So, yeah. I, you know, thinking about my grandmother's way of moving about the world has really shaped how I move about the world. That's beautiful. Um, also, I was wondering, uh, is there a little bit, is, uh, this is one uh, sort of, you know, sh shared point that you and Elamina have. The other thing that uh, seemed somewhat reminiscent, I, while I was, uh, basically I finished reading the book and then I sort of started rabbit holing, which meant that, you know, I was listening to what you'd <laughs> said earlier about the book. Mm -hmm. um, and there's an interview in which you talked about how you were a very avid reader as a child, uh, but that you grew up reading 
you know, Civil War era romances. <laughs> and it wasn't until university that uh, you sort of discovered practically yeah. this other world of literature, other being a very deliberate word that I'm using here. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and I felt like Elamina has something of that because she's also seen, of course, for very different reasons, but the mainlander culture has not given her any idea that there's yeah. any other kind of literature or art or people at all really out yeah. there. Was that uh, was that something that was happening? Yeah, for sure. I think when I was thinking about, you know, what happens when you grow up in a world that's designed for your failure, when do you realize it and what do you do about it? I was thinking about, you know, when do you realize? When do you come to see that what you're seeing isn't reality? You know, when you look at people on TV, that that's not actually who exists in the world. It's just who's given a platform and a voice. And I was thinking like, that happened for me through books, through art. Mm. For a long time, I was reading things and I was just, you know, I was reading Margaret Atwood and I was reading, you know, Stone Angel. I was reading all these incredible white writers. Um, and I was thinking that there was something wrong with me, that I was just not meant to be a main character. And it wasn't until I got to university and I started reading Black writers and I started to see two things you know, people affirming what I saw and what I was experiencing, but also Black writers challenging me to think deeper, to think about more. And so there's a, in the book, there's a scene with a blue book of poetry, and it becomes a really significant part of Elamina's kind of awareness and understanding of her place in the world, is to read this poetry book written by someone from, someone Sosi from the gutter, um, to start to understand like the beauty of who they are, but also the challenge of being who they are. And yeah, I don't know how you figure out those things without art. It's, you know, mm. one of the things that made me really excited about writing Gutter Child was the idea of creating art that could do that. Um, and then I'll also say, you know, you know, what's great about being a writer is I think all three of the female characters are kind of like a little bit of myself. And, you know, there's pieces of Elamina. There's definitely pieces in Violet that I identify right. with. And then Josephine's kind of like my dream. <laughs> like if I could be <laughs> like a more evolved version of myself, you know, Josephine's there. So that's what's fun about, about fiction, especially after mm. writing a memoir and moving into fiction. What was great is to be able to say like, oh, these are questions I have that I'm going to give Elamina. And these are questions I have about life that I'm going to give Violet. And, being able to see them live out their lives and ask questions about myself through their actions, through their story. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, heartbreak sounds like a very uh, cliched and trite term, but my heart literally broke when you, uh, well, not literally, we're still talking, but my heart broke when you said uh, you saw so much of yourself in Violet because um, you are harsh to yourself in this <laughs> book. Um, <laughs> I mean, she has it really hard um, yeah. and she's such a fantastic character, um, you know, like right from the first time that we see her. And that's also another thing, right? And I think that's something that as uh, authors around the world, we've all been correcting quite uh, diligently. Um, finding good girl characters was really hard at one point, uh, you know, at least when I was growing up, it was... Um, the fun characters, the interesting characters were almost invariably boys. Um, there were uh, only a handful of fun girl characters or interesting girl characters, not yeah. fun so much as interesting. Uh, it is such a joy to read a book which is teeming with interesting mm -hmm. female characters, you know, yeah. across the ages. Um, but uh, I wanted to, uh, you were talking about the, uh, Stone Thrower a little bit before and I um, while I was, like I said, I mean, I'm I'm so looking forward to reading it. I have ordered it uh, and I would strongly <laughs> recommend others do too from the sound of things. But um, when I was reading about it, it's about uh, your father, um, mm. who is a legendary uh, footballer. Um, and uh, but he didn't play professionally in America where he was born and he grew up in a racially segregated community. But of course, in Canada, he is uh, like I said, a legendary figure. I was wondering whether the research that you did for Stone Thrower had any impact on, is rather the behind the Rowan character. Uh, yeah. Rowan in Gutter Child is a boxer. He's exceptional. And it's uh, the general belief is that 
he'll be able to pay off his debt quicker because he's a talented athlete. Um, of course, I'm not going to give anything away, but it doesn't quite work out like that. Um, but, you know, uh, being talented ends up being as much of a constraint as it is uh, a, a gift, as it were. So yeah. can, can you talk about yeah. that? Yeah, it's interesting that you bring up Rowan as well as the like, and my dad, and also the prevalence of female characters because, and interesting female characters, because doing the work on Stone Thrower really did shape what I wanted to look at and explore more fully in Gutter Child. And Violet in particular, yes, goes on a difficult journey, but part of the question in comparison with Violet and Rowan is this, and, and David as well, is what happens to a woman who's ambitious versus what happens to a man who's ambitious and who are from mm. these communities that are um, oppressed. You know, and I think the journey of a woman in a system of oppression is very different than the journey of a man in a system of oppression. And Violet bears the brunt of it because she's so ambitious and she's so determined to kind of make a way and make it out that um, she almost can't accept anything less, which is admirable, but also in a system that's designed for your failure, there are great consequences. Um, and so, yeah, I, and, and on the flip side, um, Rowan, David's based a lot on my dad's personality, this idea that you like make good choices and good decisions all the time, and that you're generally rewarded for it in a way that is both rare and, and exciting, but also like not fair <laughs> you know, on some <laughs> level. And Rowan's story is based a lot on other athletes that I researched who were born around the same time as my dad and who went into professional sports around the same time as my dad, where the statistics were overwhelmingly bad, where, you know, the, and this is the real life stats. I'm not going to tell you what happens in the book, but no, no. in the real yeah. life stats, um, you know, the large majority of them lost everything, even if they went into professional sports and they made it to the NFL or they made it to whatever end goal was their destination. Um, they were often treated terribly while they were there. They were often marginalized within their teams. Um, they were marginalized within the league. They were paid less. People stole their money. Like by the time it was all done, they had nothing and were homeless. And this was like a legitimate, consistent pattern I kept seeing. And I was trying to find these other footballers, my dad, uh, American football, not soccer. Yes. <laughs> um, I was trying to find out what happened to the players who did get into the NFL and and this was the pretty consistent pattern. And so Rowan was my way of kind of exploring those two journeys, the journey of a, of a male character who kind of makes good decisions and solid decisions. And another one who's hoping, you know, by this, by his talent and ability, like things are going to work out. Yeah. And, uh, and it's such a, Mm, it's such a blow because uh, that is one of those uh, dreams that are held out to um, anyone who does not have privilege that, yeah. you know, your talent will be enough for you to make your, uh, make find you a place in the system. Yeah. Uh, the system is not unfair. It acknowledges yeah. talent. Like that's the, that's the under, that's the uh, deceit that underpins most um, inequalities. Right. Yeah. Um, Something that I was wondering while I was reading is that, you know, you've got a lot of dark and serious issues that are in here yeah. and you've made a very conscious decision to make it a young adult novel, uh, you know, which comes with uh, a preconceived notion, like I said, right at the beginning of our session of, you know, somewhat being easier to digest than literary fiction. Um, yeah. Why did you want it to be for a younger audience? And was it a challenge to accommodate these ideas? in a way that wouldn't feel too overwhelming for a younger audience. Yeah, I think it's interesting because actually at the, the point where I had to choose, I actually chose not to make it officially a young adult novel. Oh, I think okay. the it has been um it, it has been nominated for awards as a young adult novel. It has like been um it's being used in schools. It's it's definitely for um that age category like it's not that's not an um a mistake or an insult to me at all it's just we had to choose whether to put it in the young adult section of a of a store 
um, or not. And I chose not to put it in that section because I wanted it to feel like something anyone could read. And sometimes I feel like when it's categorized as young adult, that only young adults and those people who feel guilty about reading young adults <laughs> novels will read it. And so um, that was a choice that I made. There were positives and negatives of it. Um, and uh, But I'm happy with that choice because I think it's been able to sit in both worlds. And one of the reasons I chose you know, when you talk about literary fiction, one of the things that literary fiction often means to me is that it's, it's, there's a level of inaccessibility. There's a level in which oftentimes, not always, mm. not everybody can read it easily or freely. And I really, I knew from the start that the book had to be told first person, present tense by a 14 year old, 15 year old at the start of the book, who was going to reach about 18, 19 by the end of the book. And that in itself often categorizes something as young adult. When we hear mm. from a younger narrator, that's just automatically. And there's certain language choices that you you have to make when that's your narrative voice. And that automatically, like some people online are like, this is young adult, like, ah, you know? And it's like listening to a young person is so terrible. But for me, it's it's the choice that the story required. The story for me, I wanted readers to be reading alongside someone who was figuring out that the world sucks. <laughs> and they were they were learning with the the main character what was happening in this world. You know, Elamina literally arrives at this academy and has no idea what's happening. And so the reader gets to literally journey with her. And that was an important narrative choice. You know, um, when you're when you're writing a book, I think the choice you make about narrative and and tense, the tense of the action is such a critical one. And you really have to think it through because it has to match what's going to happen in the story. And I think some people are just like, I like writing in third person. I like writing in first person. But like each story for me requires a choice about how this story needs to be conveyed and how this story should be read. And so I think it's However, it's categories. It's done because the story required Elamina to be the voice of the book and different readers receive that in different ways. They sort of say, oh, it's young adult or, oh, it's contemporary. It's not literary fiction. All of that's fine by me. <laughs> uh, it's sci-fi, it's dystopia, whatever you want to call it, wherever you want to put it, just read it. That's all, you know? Um, and, and and be honest. I think that's the the narrative. Be honest about what's needed to tell the story. And and she had to be the one to tell the story. And so I'm fine with whatever happens after that. It's definitely a book that I think works across the ages. Um, yeah. yeah, for sure. Um, the other thing that I was wondering about, that, uh, I believe you took eight years, right, to write this book, um, yes. which is which shows in a good yeah. way, because it's mm -hmm. so... Um, and there's so many layers that you've sort of uh, imagined and no doubt kept aside and decided what you're going to ultimately include. But uh, I was thinking that you must have been finishing or at least at some part of the writing would have happened during the pandemic. And as the Black Lives Matter movement sort of came back to the foreground after, you know, um, it initially went beyond the hashtag. Um, what was it like to be writing a story like this against a backdrop like that? Mm, it was not fun. <laughs> it was mm. not fun. I think, you know, um, I'm very grateful for the eight years it took me because I think there were things in my personal life, there were things politically that were happening that kind of all worked their way in, some intentionally. Um, you know, I was going through sort of like a faith crisis and there were moments where I was able to kind of address the challenges of faith and community in, in activism. Um, but then the Black Lives Matter conversation, George Floyd, that happened right when I was finishing the book, like right when I was supposed to sign off on the book. And what ended up happening for me is George Floyd for me was actually a common culmination of many events so Ahmaud Arbery actually happened in January and Breonna Taylor was like March and then George Floyd happened in May and so by the time George Floyd happened I was like I was a wreck on many levels and one of the biggest things that was in, that it impacted was I actually had a different ending I had a whole other chapter <laughs> that wrapped up the book and that actually kind of gave it an ending that was a little bit more closed. And when the George Floyd, um, when that sort of culmination of events happened, I just got really mad. And I was just like, 
I don't actually need to wrap up this story in a way that makes everybody happy or makes everybody feel like they know, you know, how it all goes and they have a sense of like peace about Elamina's life and journey and all these things. I, I need people to ask questions. I need people to think about where they are and about where Elamina is and about what that means for in, in their communities and what that looks like. And so I took the last chapter off and I actually decided to write a sequel. Um, and so I'm, I'm working, that's what I'm working on right now. But at the time it was just out of a sense of like, I remember calling my editor and my editor, and my agent are both white. And so I'm going through this thing in a very different way than they're going through it. And I just sort of said, I'm taking the last chapter off. And my editor was like, um, uh, I don't know. She's like, I'm not sure. And I was like, oh, this is not a question. Um, and another thing that I ended up adding was there's an, there's the opening line to the book. It's not the opening line to the book, but it's like, um, to take your time with a a warning, a warning, a trigger warning. It's like my version of a trigger warning where it just says, um, this book is a work of fiction that explores a perilous world rooted in injustice as in life, the effects of injustice impact many of the characters take care with your heart and your mind as you read pause and rest as required. These are difficult times. And I wrote that because I felt really bad giving this story to the world when so much crap was happening. And I wanted people to like know that it was that kind of book that you were going to have to like chew on it. And if you weren't ready to chew on it, you should just set it aside until you were. Um, there was actually a woman who read that that warning and wrote on social media, you know, my mom's in the hospital. I got this book. Is this like something I should be reading? Because I'm feeling kind of low. And I actually answered and was like, probably not, you know, like just set it aside, maybe next year, you know, like when your mom's in a better place. When mom's kind of out of raised. hospital. Exactly. And I think her mom was like dying. And so I was like, just, just mm. nah, maybe not, you know, and I think it's, I'm the kind of person that I read sad books and serious books like all the time and they can be really serious. And I'm just like, Oh, this is a really good read. You know, like I can, I can read it and not um, carry it around, especially if it's fiction. Um, so I have trouble. I feel like I need to warn readers because not everybody reads that way. Some people are mm. like really troubled by what they read, even if it's fiction. Um, and so I just wanted to warn people because I had gone through this thing over eight years and I had gotten to this place where I was just like, this is the book that I'm giving you. This is the ending I'm giving you. Wrestle with it. Peace. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, <laughs> I'm so glad to hear there is a sequel though. Uh, yeah. Cannot wait. Um, it, it's uh, I, when you were talking about, you know, not carrying uh, the sort of emotional weight of a story with you yourself yeah. as a reader. Uh, it, it sort of amused me because I was remembering how beautifully you've written about stories uh, in one of the conversations that Ida and Elamina have. Ida is like, Ida has my heart. Um, it, it, you know, oh. it, she's, uh, you know, this is the thing, like I, I have said multiple times that this is a difficult and a sad and a dark book in many yeah. ways, but it is also about it. Again, it sounds trite to talk about survival and resilience together because yeah. we use these words together so much, you know, there's a, there's a certain comfort of vocabulary that I think we've developed in our, uh, contemporary times because of social media probably like these are flash phrases you know exactly what I mean when I say resilience when I say survival probably but it really is that like Lula Bell uh, yeah. like Ida like these are figures who have survived horrible incredibly powerful damaging things but they have survived it you yeah. know they have there is a victory in that and nobody is to take that victory away from them yeah. Um, we're almost at the end of our time, but I just want to, I want to read what is, uh, my, one of my favorite lines. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a couple of lines, uh, mm -hmm. but I just want to read that because I think it's, I think it really sums up why stories are important. And this is a conversation that Ida and Elamina are having about the history of, uh, the gutter and mainlander relations. Mm -hmm. Um, she's already got the mainlander version of it. Uh, in an earlier conversation Elamina has. And Ida sort of introduces her to the Sosi legends, which talk about uh, their history. And at one point, uh, she says, Ida says, we did not have proof that the land was ours. 
only stories told in a language they couldn't understand. And what are stories but lies that are told too often, Olo said. Olo are the tribe that are, you know, mm. the people who are supposed to signify the mainlanders. Mm. But stories, baby girl, stories are life. And I think that's what Gata Child gives us, uh, a story that is life. So um, thank you so much for it. Yeah, and thank you for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Jail Richardson and Dipanjana Pal. And sincere thanks to everyone that joined us online for this virtual edition of JLF Chrono. We'll be back in person next year.